Welcome everyone to this update on what is arguably the most important press freedom case ever. It's the first time that the mightiest government in the world, the United States, is seeking to prosecute a journalist, editor and publisher under the Espionage Act. And it's astonishing that a journalist has been held in arbitrary detention for 11 years now uh, in what the UN Rapporteur on Torture has termed a slow motion murder uh, for publishing the truth about war crimes and for harming no one. Uh, on the eve of Julian Assange's 50th birthday, he remains in Belmarsh Prison while the US case against him is in serious trouble and international protest against his treatment swells. Tonight we're going to hear from Jennifer Robinson, who has been on his legal team for more than 10 years, uh, Scott Ludlam, former senator in the Australian Parliament, uh, author and commentator and longtime supporter of WikiLeaks and Julian Assange, and Shamira Gamage from Amnesty Australia. Shamira has championed Amnesty's support for uh, Julian. So we'll, we'll hear from each of our speakers for 10 minutes and then uh, I'll kick off the discussion, uh, ask them a few questions and then go to your questions. So whilst you're listening to um, the speakers, if anything that occurs to you, please write it into the chat. So put your questions there and I'll go to them um, later. Um, I'd like to start with Jennifer because I think everyone's very, very keen to hear uh, the latest on developments in the legal case. So over to you, Jennifer. Thank you, Mary, and thank you to the Don't Extradite Assange campaign for organising this. Before I start, I want to pay tribute to the people I'm sharing this panel with. Um, first, Mary is our moderator, who has been a long-time supporter and advocate on the principled free speech issues that arise in this case, dating back to when Julian won the Sydney Peace Prize. So thank you, Mary. Also with Scott Ludlam, who as a senator for the Greens was the very first person who came out in support of Julian in Parliament and who was my go-to person and contact point in Canberra for many years and really led the advocacy that began the momentum that we're now seeing in Australian Parliament. So I really want to pay tribute to Scott for the work that he's done both in Parliament and outside of it on this issue. And of course, to Shamira at Amnesty Australia, the support of Amnesty International is absolutely essential in recognising that Julian is, in my view, a political prisoner, but also someone who deserves the support of mainstream human rights organisations like Amnesty and the work that Amnesty Australia is doing is just so important in raising awareness and also bringing more people to the table to talk about this. So I, I want to thank each of you for your work before I get started. Um, it's hard for me to believe that it's Julian's 50th birthday tomorrow. Um, I spent his 40th birthday party with him in house arrest in the north of England and Norfolk um, 10 years ago tomorrow. Uh, and that this person who has won these incredible awards, the Walkley Award for Most Outstanding Contribution to Journalism, the Sydney Peace Prize, and those two just here in Australia before we talk about the others around the world, has been under some form of restriction on his liberty since 2010 and since I've known him um, and certainly since his last milestone birthday. And what that says about our democracy is a conversation that I think we all should be having this week and this weekend. But to give you a little update in terms of where we are now, um, not just reflecting on how long this has gone on and what it's meant for him personally, um, you know, I'm sad that we can't celebrate his birthday together um, this time around. Um, but just to reflect on where we are, so as you all know, we won the extradition hearing. So in January, on the 4th of January this year, uh, the judge in the proceedings chose to discharge Julian. So he should be released and with his family. We won the hearing. Um, and it's only because the United States appealed that decision and refused his bail ref and opposed our bail application, which was then refused by the judge, that he remains in prison. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that at any point now, the United States could choose to withdraw their appeal 
and Julian could be released immediately to his family. That's how straightforward and simple the answer is in this case. But in terms of the legal process now, as you know, we won the hearing on the grounds that extraditing him would be oppressive because of his particular mental um, health issues uh, and his diagnosis of having Asperger's because of the oppressive prison conditions he would face once returned to the United States. But of course, the United States has now uh, appealed that decision. The papers are now before a judge in the High Court of London, waiting for their decision on whether the US will be granted permission to appeal. So there isn't an appeal as of right in extradition proceedings. Uh, the US government has had to seek permission to appeal. We don't know when that decision will come. It could come any time now, or it could come in months and months, in the months ahead. And this is what I think makes it so oppressive and difficult for Julian being remaining in Belmarsh prison, a high security prison where he has very limited access to visitors because of the COVID pandemic, this ongoing waiting game about when we will find out and what's next. Now, what could be next in terms of legal process? If the United States is granted permission to appeal, there will be um, an extradition, a further extradition appeal hearing at which we will likely have to cross appeal against a number of the positions that were taken in the magistrate's court's judgment. If they refuse permission, they have the ability to renew that appeal and it will be heard before likely a divisional court, so two to three judges, about whether the decision to refuse them permission was correct. But this process could drag out for a very long time. And in the meantime, Julian remains in prison where he's at risk of contracting COVID We've got an ongoing COVID pandemic crisis in the United Kingdom. Um, and in a case where he should never have been in prison in the first place. And what we have to remember is that in most extradition cases like this, if we look back at the Laurie Love proceedings, people aren't held in prison pending extradition. The only reason Julian is in prison right now is because of the Trump administration, this, out, this outrageous indictment that it has been unanimously condemned by free speech groups and mainstream media organisations the world over, but also because the United States government is continuing to oppose his bail application. So it is an incredibly unjust situation. And as a lawyer, it is unbelievably um, uncomfortable for someone who believes in the rule of law to be visiting an editor, an award-winning editor and publisher who's been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize but to have to go into a high security prison through layers upon layers of bureaucracy and security to be searched, to have my papers gone through, to be patted down twice, my fingerprints taken twice before I'm able to sit down with him in a room. And this is a disgrace when we think about our Western liberal democracy. The most recent development that I think everyone is probably most interested in is, is the revelations that we've heard from uh, an important Icelandic newspaper in the past week about the key witness, the key US witness and source, uh, Sigi Thordarsson. So um, we've learned in the last few weeks, we have been saying this for years, mind you, so this is, the, but these are important revelations which are backed up through an extensive and in depth investigative report by award winning Icelandic journalists. Um, showing that the basis for the second superseding indictment, and importantly, that's the indictment which included hacking allegations, which have never previously been made against Julian, uh, that the key source, Mr. Thordarsson, um, lied, lied to the United States and admits that he lied to the United States about the um, about his connection to WikiLeaks and the extent of his role with WikiLeaks, that he lied about any kind of participation in hacking, um, and he's admitted this on the record. Um, now, of course, this prosecution has always been problematic from a principled free speech point of view, from an evidential point of view. But now we know that one of the key witnesses, the key witness for the second su superseding indictment, has admitted that he lied and that the, there is no factual basis upon which to base the second superseding indictment. This is just the latest revelation of a case which has been filled with abuse that should justify the case being thrown out. We had evidence in the extradition proceedings in London from Daniel Ellsberg talking about how 
The simple revelation that the Nixon administration had broken into his psychiatrist's office was sufficient to have the entire case under the Espionage Act against him thrown out with prejudice, so could never be brought again, because of the abuse by government officials. In Julian's case, we are looking at a process of over 10 years where the source, Chelsea Manning, and one of the key potential witnesses has herself been subjected to torture, has herself been subjected to arbitrary detention on pain of giving testimony against Julian. We have had unlawful spying on the embassy of not just Julian and his doctors, but of us as his lawyers, myself personally as his lawyer, in our efforts to represent him and defend him against this extradition case. The seizure of his legally privileged materials from the Ecuadorian embassy. And now we know a source who has absolutely lied to the United States, which is the evidence upon which the second superseding indictment is based. Now, if it was enough in the Nixon administration to have a case thrown out for abusive process, then surely it's enough in 2021 in democratic societies. And if it's not, then we have to ask real questions about where we are as democratic societies. I just want to speak briefly before I finish about the role of the Australian government or the complete lack of role of the Australian government in this case. We've been asking the Australian government for more than 10 years. I have been going to Parliament with the assistance of Scott Ludlam when he was a senator to raise concerns with the Australian government about Julian's position. With the support of the union, the MEAA in Australia, we have repeatedly reached out to the Australian government, to current and former prime ministers, foreign ministers, asking them to take the steps that we have been asking them to do for 10 years, which is to ask the United States to drop this case. And yet we still have no confirmation from Maurice Payne that this has been done. I met personally with her office in, earlier this year and made a number of key demands, the first being after we, we've won this extradition case, this is now a humanitarian question. He is at risk of suicide. We have a judicial ju a judgment stating as much. It is time for the Australian government to step in and ask for this to be closed down. We have a new administration. We have a new administration who's committed itself to free speech. Ask them to close it down. We also ask that the Australian government ask that the US does not oppose our next bail application so that Julian, at least while the appeal process continues, can be at home with his family, with Stella and the children in London, while he prepares for this appeal. And there's all kinds of bail conditions that can be imposed to ensure that he's not a flight risk. And he's won the case. He wants to be with his family. There's no reason for him to, fl to flee. Um, we haven't heard anything back about whether the Australian government has actually done what we've asked them to do. And certainly there doesn't seem to be any public record of them asking the Biden administration to stop this, and they, sh they must because this has gone on too long. So I think that probably takes us to the 10 minutes and I'll leave it for, I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you, Mary. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, just moments ago, I had a message exchange with Stella who said that uh, for the first time in many, many months, she and the children were able to visit Julian. Uh, she, of course, had to maintain distance, but he was allowed to touch the children, which is, um, yeah, something, but, you know, it's... Absolutely heartbreaking. Can you imagine having yeah. spent the past year not being able to, to see briefly but not touch your family? It's... It's also, it's just the, the cumulative effect of uh, what's happened to Julian over the last 11 years. Um, thank you for that. We might go now to Scott, who, um, and Scott, feel free to comment on anything uh, on the case, but also uh, on how you see the campaign shaping up, uh, particularly given we now have a Deputy Prime Minister who is part of the Assange Parliamentary Support Group. Thanks, Mary. And thanks as well to Jen and Shamira for coming on the line and for giving us that background. And thanks to everybody for joining us. I know that it's a Friday night and there's a thousand other places that we can be, but this is a really important time for us, for the campaign and for Julian in particular. So thanks so much for joining us and coming on the line. I am speaking to you from Ewan country on the south oh, coast of New South Wales on ground that acknowledge the elders so I first met Julian 10 years ago this year, 
which would have been about eight months before he took refuge in the embassy, where he successfully sought political asylum because he knew that his life was at risk from precisely the kind of prosecution that eventually landed. He's been under, as, as Jen noted, he's been under some form of incarceration this entire time. And although the campaign to get him free has gone through several different waves, the one constant has been the calculated hostility dressed up as indifference by mainstream Australian politicians. And the fact that even this consensus has begun to break up and fracture tells us that we might be approaching a tipping point. Um, that's really mainly what I wanna speak about tonight, just how much the ground has shifted in our favor for getting Julian out of Belmarsh prison. Between 2010 and 11 thereabouts, Julian and the staff and supporters of WikiLeaks were subjected to the first phases of a, a very sophisticated campaign of disinformation and distraction. And we know this because some of the key elements of that campaign were leaked to WikiLeaks, who then published them. And although it took a while to get traction, if you roll forward a decade, you realize just how much the original purpose of the organization of WikiLeaks and exactly what it was they published, the meaning of what was published and the importance of the incredible archive of documents has been occluded behind this persistent campaign of disinformation. So if you've heard rumors or stories about Julian's socks or his cat, or that he is some kind of pawn of the Russian government, then congratulations, you've been subjected to that disinformation campaign too, as we all have which makes it all the more striking, I think, how his arrest and his forceful removal from the embassy in 2019 blew away a lot of those illusions and recrystallized the global campaign around the reality of the prosecution and what it means. A Walkley Award-winning public Australian government is letting it happen, and the Biden administration is seemingly allowing this headless process to continue. And I think that's reforged the consensus that Julian must be freed because Trump and Bill Barr and Mike Pompeo are gone. A lot of the senior appointees of the Trump administration are gone. And in the US, the Courage Foundation and the DEA campaign have lined up all of the major human rights and press freedom organizations, from Amnesty International who are joining us tonight, to Human Rights Watch, to the ACLU, to Reporters Without Borders. In the UK, there's a growing movement amongst cross-party MPs that have led a delegation to Belmarsh and are attempting to get at least make contact with Julian and then to get him free. There's action this week in the Italian parliament. It's breaking out all over. In Australia, we see the same coalition of human rights organisations, including Press Freedom, groups like Digital Rights Watch, Julian's Union, the MEAA, and of course, more recently, the peak body for Australian trade unions, the ACTU and their secretary, Sally McManus, the statement that they made in May really cements and joins that consensus that is emerging that Julian must be freed. Politically, things are shifting quite fast. There's a parliamentary friendship group, which Jen and Mary have already mentioned. And my experience of those, this is a, quite a functional one. This is a place where MPs from the crossbench and the major parties can meet on areas of common interest, you close the doors, you don't always take minutes, you leave your political weapons at the door and you work out what it is that you can do for whatever the purpose of that group's establishment was. This is a very functional group. It's quite adeptly chaired. It has membership from all of the major parties and minor parties, the Greens and crossbenchers. This is the kind of group that has met with the ambassador. It sent correspondence directly to the US government. They've been very active, including this week. You've probably seen the video. We are Australian parliamentarians, and we're calling on the government of the United States to drop the unprecedented Espionage Act charges against Julian Assange. And we're imploring the British government to release him from prison and send him home. Like politicians in the US and the UK, we are elected to defend our citizens' rights. Voters expect us to hold accountable those who commit wrongdoing not to punish those who expose it, such as Julian Assange. Citizens expect us to protect journalists and publishers, not to imprison them for their work. Julian Assange is right now being arbitrarily detained in the UK for publishing activity. His treatment violates the Convention Against Torture and its persecution threatens journalists worldwide. 
the world's leading human rights and press freedom groups are unequivocally denouncing the charges against him, and we join them. Australian citizens want Julian Assange to be free. Indeed, one of the largest petitions in Australia's history, with over half a million signatures, has been tabled in the Australian Parliament, calling on the United States to free Assange. The ruling by UK District Judge Vanessa Barrett on January the 4th of this year to deny extradition provides the opportunity for urgent reconsideration. President Biden, we implore you, 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 please drop the US government's appeal in light of the judgment rendered in the UK. I think that's an enormously significant development. For the first time since this began, the alternative Australian Prime Minister has said that time is up and that Julian needs to be freed. And now, as others have indicated, the Deputy Prime Minister, Barnaby Joyce, who's been a long-standing member of that group and participated certainly in the meetings that I've attended, it takes a lot to get Barnaby Joyce, Sally McManus, the Labor Party, the Greens and all the key crossbenchers onto the same page. But this is where we are. So that tipping point feels close, but the thing about tipping points is that you never know how far away they are. And when there are cracks in the armour or when you can get a sense that things are shifting, that's not a time to sit back and feel comfortable. That's a time to step it up, to turn it up, to go harder and to make sure that we get this over the line. So here's one really simple thing that we can all do. I tried this today. It took three minutes. And I want to see if we can really kick this off online and make sure that they're getting thousands and then tens of thousands of these. Write to the President of the United States. There's a drop down window there where they want to know what country you come from. Tell them that you're an Australian citizen. Tell them whatever you like and that Julian Assange needs to be free. They, all he needs to do is drop Donald Trump's appeal. He doesn't have to own this. The incoming administration doesn't have to own this Trump era atrocity so that Julian can come home. Then the most or the second most important thing after you've done that is share that you've done it. And it doesn't matter if you have five followers on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. Let those five people know that you've done it and give them the opportunity to speak up for Julian as well. I feel as though we're close, but we're not going to get Julian out of Belmarsh Prison by congratulating ourselves we're sharing the information on calls like this, and now we need to turn it up so that we can get our friend out of prison. Thanks so much for coming along. Thank you, Scott, and thank you for that link in the chat. Um, I think we need to get on to that. Please make sure you share it on Twitter and Facebook, um, whatever your uh, method of sharing such things is. Um, lots of things to talk about or, there, Scott. But oh, Mary, um, first, uh, sorry, yes. can I throw... Can I throw one last thing in? Um, and this is yes, for people who haven't quit do. Facebook, which we should all do, um, is you can encourage your MP to join that parliamentary fringe. You're breaking up, Scott. Well over an MP and get them to get active on call. Yes, we need to approach our MPs and put pressure on them to join this parliamentary group, which has swelled to a couple of dozen members now. And I think the, the only party from which there isn't a member, is the Liberal Party. Um, now, Shamira, would you please give us an update on what Amnesty is doing and how you think the uh, campaign is shaping up? Yeah, absolutely. And and I'd also like to echo what everyone, everyone else has said so far and just be um, very grateful for the fact that we can come together like this um, at actually quite a pivotal moment and also an important time where I think, as Scott said, the tide is starting to turn in everyone's favour and for the outcome that we want. And I want to say thanks to, to Jennifer, um, Scott, and to you, Mary, again, for all the work you've been doing, chipping away. It isn't easy, um, but it all comes together uh, over time. The main thing I wanted to kind of ground this in, um, you know, related to the theme that we're talking about today, um, are threats to the free press in the 21st century. And there does seem to be a, a bit of a trend taking place, um, you know, around the world, uh, in, in, you know, across borders and, and uh, whether it's the Anglosphere or, um, you know, the, the East, however you want to define it. But there's certainly been a bit more of a, a consistent nature of journalists being cracked down upon. Uh, we've seen it in Australia. If you were keeping score, I feel as though you could see there was a bit of a consistent um, uptick over the last few years. Um, 
We saw instances like Annika Smithhurst, um, you know, being raided. We saw uh, comments uh, by Mike Pizzullo uh, encouraging uh, the AFP for doing a good job for that raid, uh, which which obviously sets a bit of a, a precedent and sends a signal. We have seen recently, and Amnesty's reported on this too, in Belarus, Raman Protesevich uh, was arrested uh, on a flight with his partner and imprisoned. Maria Ressa in the Philippines. Of course, and a lot of the time, you know, uh, a lot of these journalists are speaking up against uh, governments and the actions that they would probably prefer, you know, don't come to light. So with all that in mind and all that context, I also wanted to mention that, you know, a lot of this seems to come about with the fact that we're living in the information age. Um, it's a, it's a bit of a new um, uh, you know uncharted territory, I guess you could say for governments. They have to find a way to kind of keep track of what's being sent, uh, you know, and, and it, we live in the information abundance age, I would say as well. So you know with all of that in mind, Assange kind of came through with WikiLeaks at a time which was um, somewhat innovative uh, to, to share this sort of information to the public, to cut the middleman, uh, and, and you could hear the information straight from the horse's mouth. Now, that obviously poses uh, a huge threat to, to governments, particularly when it's not information that they're comfortable or, or happy sharing, especially when it's human rights abuses, uh, in fact. And I think um, with all, we, can, we can pretty much see that, you know, Assange is being used as a scapegoat in that instance. Um, it's incredibly disproportionate the way that he's been treated, um, let alone discussions on his health um, and, and how that's transpired. Um, uh, it's been very clear that there's, that he's been made um, an example of so that it discourages anybody else from performing similar behaviour. Um, that's a very strong signal. Uh, of course, um, you know, Amnesty, uh, our role in this is we've actually been quite supportive um, uh, of Assange and the work that he's done. We, you know, in 2009, there was a media uh, freedom award that was that was awarded to to Julian, um, and we've consistently called on his um, on his release and for the extradition uh, charges to be dropped. And we've ramped that up, particularly since the events in Belmarsh over the last um, uh, couple of years. Now, uh, we have really strong concerns about where this. Um, where this precedent can go and, 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 again, the effect that it can send to um, publishers, um, you know, the media industry, uh, and, uh, and, and I think that's very clearly an, an intentional uh, action there from the US government. So, yeah, certainly I've been reiterating that. Again, the importance of this issue is, is that it does impact every single person. It impacts every one of us. Now, there are a million issues going on around the world Everyone's aware of that, um, you know, uh, and I feel as though people generally have a certain capacity for what sort of um, human rights abuses or, or issues they can take up and, and, and you know, put their energy behind. Um, and I think um, it's certainly our role and, and all the supporters and all the people on the call today, you know, in your own way and in your own circles, um, you know, uh, uh, carrying this message and kind of highlighting its importance. And a lot of the time that can be quite complex when it's communicated, but I think it's really simple. You know, if if this precedent is set, and already we can we can imagine how many people haven't spoken up with information because of fear of being treated the same. Um, you know, it's certainly not a um, uh, you know a roadmap that we want to go down. But if that is the case, you will be consuming information, making your judgments on the on the world. Uh, you know, voting, which is the most important thing uh, in this democracy, with perhaps um, information that doesn't tell you the whole story and information that um, doesn't actually, you know, um, truly inform you as to who you're voting for. And that is exactly what we need in, in a stable, strong democracy. And that's why I think we're all here today, because we see the, the long-term effects. We know how much of a threat it actually is. And obviously there's the um, significant personal um, cost to, to Julian and his health and his family that have had to suffer through this process. So, um, yeah, I, I think... From a campaigning perspective, uh, it's been quite interesting. I mean, as I mentioned, things really ramped up over the last couple of years um, and particularly getting a petition signed, a global petition, uh, calling on the charges to be dropped um, for the extradition to be halted. Um, that got around 400,000 signatures. Um, we saw a, number, a lot of countries in uh, Europe, South America, um, you know, the US itself getting behind this petition. We, we then delivered it to the US um, embassy here in Sydney. Um, and that did get some, um, you know, did create a bit of a groundswell and, and raise the issue in, particularly in the, in the media here as well, uh, which was really positive. Uh, we've kept up the calls online. 
um, you know, similar to to Scott, uh, I, I would um, ask everyone here to perform a, a Twitter action, which we've actually just done only about three or four hours ago, um, which is calling on the Department of Justice um, and the uh, and the UK there um, to to drop the the charges and halt the extradition directly. So that's something we want to um, sort of snowball online. Um, I noticed Assange was trending yesterday, which is always great. We kind of like to time it when these moments are happening. And obviously with his birthday coming up, it's a great chance to raise more awareness and, um, you know, educate people that may not be as aware of this issue and looking to learn um, and then hopefully take action. And all those little actions, while they might, might seem, you know, minuscule at the time or like it might not be doing much, they certainly do add up. And I can certainly, um, you know, uh, uh, vouch for that, seeing how many, how many instances uh, of petitions, consistent calls, um, leveraging what I call bridges. So, you know, people in, in the public eye that kind of uh, uh, may have their own influence or audience and they can kind of carry this narrative and story to a new audience. Um, it, it really does uh, build uh, uh, with its momentum. And that is usually what seems to be the thing to topple um, these sort of, um, uh, you know, uh, over, overhanded um, actions by governments. So we're definitely on our way. Um, reflecting again on the last couple of, of years, I've seen a, a, a definitely a shift in the nature of the conversation. I've seen a shift on the types of people that are getting involved in this campaign and who's supporting. Um, just throwing back to December last year before the extradition um, um, trial happened, I noticed there were people, both Republicans, Democrats, that had condemned Assange back in the day that had actually taken the time to go on Twitter and say, I apologise and retract my statements from before I'm actually in support. Now, that, that in itself shows that this is a bipartisan issue. Again, reiterating, it's not about this side or that side. It's, it, it is something that can kind of unite everybody and does impact everybody. So that's, again, something that Amnesty is trying to, um, uh, you know, fuel, get as many people um, aware of this issue and taking action again. Um, and I've noticed as well that, um, yeah, just... The, the, the numbers of people, again, there are little groups like People for Assange in Sydney um, that, again, do that chip away on the ground, getting people to sign petitions every day work year after year. And from them, I've, I've heard when we last spoke that it was really positive responses from people in the public. So it's been a it's probably one of the hardest challenges you could ask for, you know, uh, uh, for everybody here today to try and unravel. Um, you know, the, the, the sort of um, information that's been put out there and the image that's been put out there consistently for a long time. But I, I certainly believe that people are aware. It's just a matter of awareness, education, take action, all that comes together and you just be consistent and then um, and targeted to the Biden administration. And we hope that we're not far off now from hopefully a, um, some really positive, positive news, but we've got to keep at it. Thank you, Shamira. That's um, an excellent uh, suggestion. The amnesty tweet is important to get onto, and Scott's suggestion of contacting uh, the White House. We've we've got a number of things coming through on the chat uh, in terms of suggested actions: call, calling the Department of Justice, emailing the Department of Justice, writing to the Attorney General, etc. And a number of actions that have happened recently, such as the German Bundestag uh, have sent an open letter to President Biden. Um, one of the things though, that I think people are particularly interested in at the moment and wanted to know more about is the effect of the latest developments in the legal case. Uh, Sigurd Todas and uh, admitting that he lied uh, in exchange for immunity from prosecution. What does that actually do to the case, Jennifer? Uh, because that second superseding indictment came very, uh, came very late in the piece and now it's really fallen, it's in tatters. Uh, all they have, it appears, to rely on now is uh, the prosecute pr the fact that they're prosecuting a journalist that's that reality is surfacing again because the hacking case which they tried to the hacking charge which they've tried to bolster has um, proven to be a huge embarrassment. Yes, well, I mean, I agree with everything you've said, Mary. Um, as we argued in court, and as was raised by Mark Summers QC during our extradition proceedings. This second superseding indictment, which was based upon Mr. Thodarsson's testimony 
and evidence uh, came very late in the piece. And as Mark Summers QC said in court, well, this is because we have such strong free speech arguments on the rest of the, the case. Um, they're trying somehow to pull this away from a case involving publication to make it something else, to make it about hacking. Now, of course, um, these allegations were always problematic and, and we raised that, but said in the extradition proceedings, because this second superseding indictment came so late, I mean, consider this, the superseding indictment based on this evidence came, was served on Julian on the first day of the extradition proceedings in September 2020, when we'd already closed, we'd already served all the evidence, we'd already served all the submissions, we'd already made all our legal arguments, and then suddenly the US was presenting a whole entire new case, which we didn't have any opportunity to properly or reasonably engage with before the extradition proceedings. Now, following an in-depth investigative process by leading Icelandic journalists, we not only know that the US engaged in questionable legal, well, arguably unlawful, uh, evidence gathering activities in Iceland, which the Icelandic government is concerned about. But second, that this 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 key witness not only has no credibility, we've, we know that he's a convicted he's a convicted criminal, having been convicted in relation to sexual abuse in, res, in re, respect of minors and fraud related offences. Um, that the US case has has no factual basis. Now, what that that is a question now for the Department of Justice. In terms of what we can do legally in the UK, we have done everything that we can do. We have challenged the extradition, we won the case, the US is now appealing, and we will continue to argue for that. The question is about is now for the Department of Justice about whether this is an indictment that they ought to be pursuing. And what that might look like in terms of a future legal process in the United States, we hope it will never get to that point because, of course, we don't want Julian extradited there and we're doing everything that we can and our extradition legal team in the UK is doing everything that we can to prevent that from happening. What this shows is that the Department of Justice needs to relook at this case uh, and, and consider again whether this is an indictment that's worth pursuing. Uh, but the... <laughs> Part of the problem is here that this very um, serious development in the case uh, hasn't been covered by the mainstream media. And I'm wondering, uh, Jennifer or Scott, if you have any ideas of how, how we can uh, make this happen. So, for example, Jennifer, would his, why, why isn't his legal team uh, giving a press conference to brief the media about about this latest development, or have they? I have myself given an interview to, to Democracy Now! Uh, in the United States, so I'm on the record talking about yes. this um, and making public comment about, about the evidence. So, you know, we can't do more. It's, it's really a matter for the media. And, and I leave the that. mainstream really media for, Scott and for, for Shamira, perhaps, about <laughs> uh, why we're yep. not seeing broader coverage of this and what could be done to change that. I think it's complex and I don't think it's as simple as it looks at the outset. It's not as simple as just condemning the media for not covering it. And I think it's kind of important that we don't paint ourselves into a position where we're self-describing as marginal or not very interesting. Whenever there's a significant development in the case, when he was ripped out of the embassy, when he went into the embassy, or the significant revelations, Julian leads news bulletins in every time zone on this planet. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's important to realise that this is the highest profile case of its kind anywhere in the world at this time, and it has been for years. As to why they haven't covered these incredible revelations, I've seen theories from, well, the scoop was already made in Iceland, so what's the point of echoing it? Two, it's kind of a technicality and what even is a superseding indictment? Three, perhaps there's a D-notice in place. Somebody's popped that proposition into the chat already, whereby there's a kind of an informal wink and a nod agreement uh, by media organisations that they're not going to blow oxygen into this particular development because it might harm national security. Who even knows? Or the fourth theory, which somebody already mentioned this evening, that they're just bloody slow, stretched, overworked, not interested, interested in different stuff. There's a pandemic. Like the reason why particular newsrooms would pick up a, an issue and run with it are, are many and varied. I don't feel it's helpful for us to act as though we're some kind of persecuted, marginalised minority. They'll catch up. 
In the meantime, don't despair. Whatever channels we have, Jen's done a piece on Democracy Now. What other channels do we have, whether it's social media, whether we could pitch to local newspapers, whatever we can do to amplify it is helpful. They'll catch up. We can't afford to wait for them. Yes, indeed. I think you're right, Scott. The um, mainstream media on occasion uh, lags behind in covering certain developments in the case, such as the Spanish case, the significance of the Spanish case and the uh, spying of US intel agencies on Julian in the embassy and on his uh, legal representatives. Um, let's just go to um, come to Australia now where we have a Deputy Prime Minister who's uh, uh, part of the parliamentary group and has um, made very strong uh, comments in support of Julian. And I'm just wondering what um, you think would be the best way to, to bring him to a position where he's going to speak to the Prime Minister and make a public statement about what Australia should be doing. Ring or email his office. Yes. So this stuff isn't rocket science. He's just a human being mm -hmm. with uh, an office full of overworked staff. Mm -hmm. He's going to be juggling presumably some kind of changed coalition agreement with the Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. There'll be a thousand things on his mind. Just contact the office, dead simple. Social yeah. media, direct email to the office or a phone call. Dear Barnaby, in any revised coalition agreement, can you make sure that we get Julian out of Belmarsh? And you'd be pushing yeah. on an open door because he already agrees with that proposition. I think as Jennifer was pointing out earlier, uh, this could be a very, very long process with the appeal and potentially a, an, an appeal after the appeal. So the way to bring this to a resolution is that we need a political solution and political solutions only happen when the public pressure on politicians. So I think that's something that we all need to make sure all our contacts are onto as well, not just each one of us, but also all our social media contacts. Jennifer, do you hear anything on the ground about what sort of an appetite there is from the Biden administration to continue this? Uh, from what you've been saying, there's no indication whatsoever that they are contemplating dropping the case. I don't have any reliable word from on the ground at the moment. Um, while we're talking about the United States, so I'd also like to pay tribute to the fact that John Shipton and Gabriel, Julian's brother and father, have been over there on a huge multi-city mm. tour trying to raise support and raise awareness and engaging publicly and privately um, with figures in the US administration and outside of it about the case. So. Hopefully we'll have some more updates soon from the United States. But if we talk about the Biden administration's public, um, public positioning, this is an administration that has stated its commitment to freedom of speech. It's an administration that has stated its commitment to closing Guantanamo. And it is a very strange position indeed for an administration taking these principled positions or stated policy positions to be continuing with this prosecution, which everyone agrees is a huge threat to free speech, completely inconsistent with the First Amendment, and to be prosecuting and imprisoning the person who's responsible for revealing information about Guantanamo that enabled the campaign to close that place down. Um, it's an incredibly hypocritical position. So, so I think there is an openness and there is, is concern within the administration, at least that's what we're hearing, there is concern about this case. But as we've heard from the stated uh, response from the White House press officer is, well, the Department of Justice is an independent body, uh, contrary to what it was under the Trump administration, and it's a matter for the Department of Justice. But of course, we all know the reality is that this is a political case, it's been heavily politicised, and a political decision could be taken at any time to close this down. Uh, Jen, there's also a question saying, can you give us some news on the Spanish court case? I actually don't have any new updates on the Spanish court case. My understanding is it is progressing. Um, further witness evidence has been taken in the in the past, in the previous few months. Uh, but my colleagues in Spain are the best place to to advise on the updates on that case. So I, I'll leave it to them. 
Um, you're also uh, helping uh, the Italian journalist who is attempting to get documents under FOI from Australia who are, are dragging their feet. Can you uh, give us any idea of what's happening there? Yes. Yeah, so uh, in addition to my role as acting as counsel for Julian, um, I am also counsel to the Italian journalist Stefania Marizzi in her long ongoing battle uh, freedom of information battle against both the Metropolitan Police Service and the Crown Prosecution Service. So as many of you will know, as a result of our FOI requests and legal challenges on Stefania's behalf, Stefania has obtained a, a wealth of interesting information, including evidence that the CPS had deleted emails, evidence that it was in fact the UK imploring Sweden to continue with the case, um, but the current battle that we face and that we will be in court for next week um, is a long-running battle against the Metropolitan Police Service uh, um, in which Stefania has been asking for information about the three named WikiLeaks journalists, Kristen Raffinson, Joseph Farrell and Sarah Harrison. Now, of course, Steph made this request many years ago at a time when... One, we didn't know whether there was an indictment in the United States, but we knew there was an ongoing criminal investigation. Julian was still inside the embassy. But what her request was, um, the thrust of her request was to try to understand what role, if any, the British police and authorities were playing in the United States criminal investigation into WikiLeaks. That is, what role are the British police playing in investigating British journalists doing their job in Britain in aid of a foreign criminal investigation. Now, we have been up and down the courts on this case. They have tried to block us on data protection issues, which of course, all three of the WikiLeaks journalists said, why are you blocking this? You had, Steph Stefania has my consent. And through this case, we set the legal precedent to say that journalists can make requests that touch upon personal data information provided they have the consent of the named individual so we got over that hurdle then after Stefania litigating up and down the courts for the past five years um, with my assistance uh, the UK government tried to ban, uh, block it on jurisdictional grounds saying well actually we don't have jurisdiction we question whether we have jurisdiction to receive FOI requests from foreign journalists so we had to have another hearing in January this year to argue that point which we were again successful on and now the Metropolitan Police Service is trying to block this information from Stefania, citing national security exemptions, claiming that counter-terrorism policing practices would be put at risk if they disclosed information that was gathered or is held about WikiLeaks journalists. Now, this is a serious matter. If you have the police applying a national security exemption, they are basically admitting or it seems to us they're admitting that they are using counter-terrorism tactics against journalists. And for that reason, the National Union of Journalists has intervened in the case and made submissions saying journalism is not a crime, national security journalism is not a crime, and it is an outrage that the British police are applying these exemptions and these tactics in respect of journalists. So we are in court next week to argue uh, this case. And again, I want to pay tribute to Stefania for her com long-standing commitment to accessing information to tell us what's actually going on in this case and in the various aspects of this case. Here, yeah, here to Stefania. Um, and they're also using anti-terrorism legislation to arrest comedians in this country. So, um, <laughs> yes, Extraordinary. Um, Shamira, can you give us uh, some idea of how the amnesty campaign is going internationally? I, I know in Australia you are very active and it's uh, tremendous, um, but just tell us how it's going internationally and, and where uh, the campaign is doing really well. Yeah, thanks, Mary. Um, yeah, as you mentioned, it, there was a lot of... Um, a lot, of, a lot of drive, I suppose you could say, um, coming from Australia, obviously uh, for, for an Aussie, um, very close to home. And, and that did rub off um, across a number of sections um, across Amnesty. Uh, the, the UK office has been doing quite a bit um, uh, there as well in, in kind of guiding the strategy, I would say. We've had 
um, fairly frequent um, sort of strategy sessions and campaign strategy sessions to reflect on what tactics have worked, what is cutting through with the public, um, you know, what is the audience that we need to reach to kind of um, create critical mass on this campaign and what sort of, um, uh, what messaging and communication actually speaks to them so they listen in the first place, uh, whilst also segmenting, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the demographics or segment um, of society that we know wouldn't, would never consider support. So it's kind of trying to find the, the, the gray area where we can kind of um, educate and create awareness there. Um, so yeah, it's been a it's been a bit of a um, a campaign focused on moments as we are here today. Um, you know, World Freedom of Press Day being another one, um, the trial itself, um, and the appeal date. So we've kind of waited uh, for those moments to come up and leverage them. Um, that's a number of them are global. So as I mentioned, um, particularly in Europe, there's been quite a quite a lot of support. Uh, the main ones um, were around Austria, Slovenia. Uh, I think Portugal there as well um, that come to mind um, and and that seems to be growing as well um, the more that we push on this. Um, again, the fact that the um, extradition uh, didn't happen during that trial was also a really positive sign. Obviously, the nature of it is something else to discuss. Um, but um, yeah, we, we, we have seen um, that sort of concerted honing in of our campaigning, um, having a bit more impact. So we'll just continue to do that. Um, we're going to focus on trying to, you know, go, go a bit closer to home in America if possible, um, but we're always reevaluating and finding the best way to, to do that. So There are a number of questions too about um, Julian's situation in Belmarsh. Um, I don't know whether, I know, Scott, I know you uh, have contact with him and Jen, obviously you do. Uh, is there any more that we can add any more that you can say about how he's faring? Uh, unfortunately, because I'm in Australia at the moment and with the border closures, mm. it's very difficult. I obviously can't visit him. We also have the COVID restrictions in the UK in any event, even if I were in the UK, mm. uh, it would be difficult, if not impossible for me to visit him. So I haven't seen him in person since the extradition hearing in the cells under the old Bailey. Um, even Stella, his partner, has had difficulty visiting him. And as you mentioned, Mary has only been in to see him recently. Um, mm. But we are obviously in regular contact with him, if not myself, our, our legal team. But like I said, it's incredibly isolating. And this long wait to find out what, if anything, is going to happen with the appeal is, is incredibly difficult. So um, it's, you it's know, we can't, there's not that much more to say. Yes, no, well, I think a lot of supporters are very concerned about how he's faring uh, precisely because of that, because we're not uh, getting any news of him really and because people can imagine what it's like uh, after being pursued relentlessly for so many years and uh, persecuted, um, the effect that it would be having on him. Um, just before we wrap up, I thought I'd ask each of you if there's a final point that you'd like to make or uh, a take-home message for everyone listening from your perspective. Uh, Shamira, would you like to start? Yeah, sure. I think, you know, um, yeah, we've, we've been speaking on this topic, you know, over quite a bit of time. And it, like I said earlier, it's just nice to see that the the – the, the changing sentiment and it going from, you know, um, uh, sort of focusing on the issues at hand to understanding that they're now leading to progress um, and there's more optimism, positivity. I think when it comes to campaigning, that's something that um, a lot of the time you, you have to have because you have to make, you have to believe that you can make these things happen and do whatever it takes to get there. And that's something that drives movements and gets people on board, right? So I think a, a, more of a focus on that now is important for everybody, but I think it's naturally, it's organically happening, which is um, really heartening. Um, and I think no matter who you are, again, the people on this call are obviously um, you know, quite supportive and I'm sure I've been taking actions, talking to people, uh, raising awareness, doing what they can. Um, I, I think it really just to be, you know, well done. And uh, it's not easy. I know it's a, it's a consistent trip away, but that's when you get the most results and that's the only way it can work here. Um, and, um, and, and we're all doing this for very meaningful reasons and important reasons on, on, on many fronts. So just keep going and keep banding together um, and, uh, and reiterate what Scott said about calling your MPs. I think with Barnaby now, that's a great opportunity. 
um, and just continue with the online, you know, being vocal online, be consistent, um, be, be welcoming in a sense. So we're not kind of pushing people away, but only drawing people in, which only builds the, the momentum. But um, yeah, let's, let's keep pushing and let's keep going. Thank you. Thanks, Shamira. Uh, Scott? I feel as though there's a couple of concrete things that have come out of tonight. As long as we agree that a call like this is just the first step, that none of us get to go away feeling as though all right, we participated, we've done a bit for Julian. We haven't. What really matters now is what happens after this call. So call your MP, your federal MP, and find out if they're involved in the parliamentary friendship group for Julian Assange and if they are what they're pressing that group to do. And let's get on to Barnaby with a powerful will. We know we've got a supporter in the second highest political office in the land. So let's go for it. Thanks, Scott. Jennifer. Well, first and foremost, I want to say that I feel a sense of um, optimism seeing the incredible solidarity efforts that have been taking place over the past week um, in relation to Julian, whether it's parliamentarians coming out, uh, people getting out protesting the events that I've seen in the US and Australia and the UK and elsewhere. And I really just want to emphasize how important those solidarity efforts are because this case is so political and it requires political action to bring it to an end. So um, I would just encourage everyone to take the campaign hints that you've heard from Shamira and Scott and to get involved because every little bit helps. And as for us as a legal team, it is incredibly encouraging to see that. And I feel a sense of optimism and, and, a, and a sense that we can actually bring this to an end. And I've always believed that. It's why I'm still here and still fighting for him. And we, of course, will continue to do so, but it, we need more help and your help is important. Thanks, Jennifer. And from me, I'd just like to say, be outraged. This is a journalist. He's been in arbitrary detention for 11 years. He's turning 50. He has two young children. Even if he didn't, he should not be there because we are putting truth in prison. So please be outraged and uh, don't give up. Uh, I think all those messages that you've heard tonight are very, very important. Uh, this does need a political solution, but political solutions don't happen unless there is a groundswell of public putting pressure on those politicians. Thank you to all three of you tonight, Jennifer, uh, Scott, Shamira, and, and thank you for joining us tonight. Thank <laughs> you.